From Microbe TV, this is Immune, episode number four, recorded on January 23rd, 2018. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hi. Welcome, everyone. Welcome back. This is great. Um, 2018. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe it's 2018 already. And we were a little delayed here, and it's almost the end of uh, January already, getting this podcast going in January. But looking forward to an exciting year of Immune this year. From Worcester, Ohio, Steph Langle. Hey, now. Happy to be podcasting from Ohio. <laughs> I'm going to introduce a little weather. I know the other podcasts do that, but it's about 38 degrees here. So the, the snow melted this weekend, but mm. it's still pretty darn cold. So a little cloudy, but happy to be back in 2018. Happy 2018, both of you. Absolutely. Yeah, same the to first, you. First immune, and we're looking forward to 12 immunes this year, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Plus maybe some 101s in there. Maybe. Yeah. So it has been really cold, I guess, everywhere for a while. Yes. And it's just warmed up today. It's it's raining actually here, 16 Celsius. So I think oh, it's warmer. I We're think at it's nine here. I so. think it's going to get cold again, which is fine because it is January, right? Right. It is to be expected. Yeah. So <laughs> that's the way it goes. Uh, I'm looking forward to today's uh, episode. We don't have a paper, but we do have a, a topic. Yes. And Cindy was brave enough to uh, put all these great notes in here. Yes, thank you, Cindy. It's a big topic, but it's quite exciting. So, Cindy, don't um, uh, don't be um, dismayed if we interrupt you a lot. We just might. I think you should okay. because I did. I did put a lot in here, and uh, I'll tell you sort of what I'm hoping to cover. And so, for those of you who didn't catch it from the title, we're going to today talk about CAR T cells or chimeric antigen receptor T cells. And this is something we've mentioned a couple of different times on the podcast, and people have anxiously been writing emails to us saying, "When are you actually going to cover it?" And so here it is today. And so um, CAR T cells are a type of cancer immunotherapy. And I thought one of the things I wanted to do was briefly introduce what immunotherapy is um, and a couple of the developments that happened over time that got us to this point to these CAR T cells and then exactly what are they. And, and they're this amazing sci-fi, completely synthetic engineered thing that we've done based on what we know about the immune system. And it's actually spectacular that we could do this and that it actually works. But to understand what it is, I think we need to tell the, the listeners a little bit about T cells and B cells. So once we, we have this little introductory part, we'll do a little primer on T cells and B cells. And then we'll really get into the nitty gritty about how you make these things, how the therapy works. And um, I thought it would be cool to talk about some of the newer tweaks that have happened on this because there's the basic CAR T cells and then there's a whole bunch of different things that people have done on this. And then I'm uh, hoping to come back around at the end and sort of introduce the idea that people are taking this outside of the realm of cancer now. And then maybe a little bit on the some of the negatives because it's all going to sound really fantastic that this is going <laughs> to cure cure everything as we go through here. So that was sort of the overall goal of what I had for today. And so starting with just basically what cancer immunotherapy is, it's really the holy grail of oncologists. And of course, a, an oncologist is a doctor that treats people with cancer. And so the idea is how do, can we harness our immune system and turn it against tumors. And for a long time, people thought that you, you couldn't do this. So cancers are part of our own body. They're just malfunctioning cells and, and they're growing independently of their signals. And there, it was thought for a long time that our immune system couldn't actually see them because our immune system is designed to, to see foreign things and to not react to things that are self or, you know, of our own origin. And so it was thought we couldn't see tumors. But there was hints of it over many, many years and a few experiments that people did that really showed that we could, in fact, have our immune system attack cancer, but it just doesn't do it all the time. And so understanding why can't it do it all the time and how could we massage or, or redirect the immune system actually against the tumors was really where people were. And so if you think about um, 
basically everyone knows someone who has had cancer. And if you think about the main treatment for cancer, it is extremely nonspecific and designed to just kill any cells that are growing fast in the body. And so this is the chemotherapy. You put a lot of drugs in or you put radiation on the patient and you're going to kill anything that's growing fast. But the, the downside of that is that chemotherapy is going to target those fast growing cells and they're not just tumor cells. So there are a lot of tissues like hair and skin and intestine that turn over quite rapidly. And so they're really dramatically affected with this chemotherapy or radiation. And so what we really wanted to do is say, how, how can we get more specific? How can you find the tumor and not attack all of these other normal cells? So that's really been always the holy grail of this cancer immunotherapy. The problem with chemo is that it would go into your vein and hit everything, right? right. Correct. And you yeah. Couldn't, you couldn't directed at a tumor. Right. And I think what, what patients are really coming up with is this decision of, do I want a longer life with, with lower quality of life or, or maybe a shorter life where I can actually enjoy my time with my family? And uh, it's, it's nice to see that maybe there's some other options out there. Yeah. The other, the other issue, of course, besides nonspecificity is that you get resistance um, often yes. very quickly to certain mm -hmm. agents, right, within months. Yes. And, this, and then you have no re recourse. You don't. Uh, I remember my dad was being treated for colon cancer with fl five mm -hmm. fluorouracil in the 80s. Yes. So initially he had this great regression. The tumor went away. And then the next week it was back and the guy said, don't come back anymore. There's nothing I can oh. do, you know? Mm. Yeah. Can you yeah. imagine how that feels, right, as a patient? Uh, Especially I, like, you, you've spent your life going to doctors and hopefully being treated and so forth and then go home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That was right. pretty sad. So hopefully we can improve on that. Yeah, and so I guess one of the original improvements was um, kind of the directed radiation. So you could go and direct it right into the tumor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that helped things. And, uh, and so I guess really when the first iteration of immunotherapy as we know it mm -hmm. was to develop monoclonal antibodies. By the way, there's a great history of chemotherapy in, in the emperor of all maladies. I, have you read that? I have you? not. I haven't, but I've heard you talk about it. I no, you should read it. It's by Siddhartha Mukherjee, who's an oncologist here. He won the Pulitzer Prize for it. It's a, it's a wonderfully written book, and he's got a great history of chemo and how it went through different stages. And, uh, and you know, in the end, it's, it's, as you say, it's still not great. But it brings, I think it comes up to monoclonals pretty much. Yeah, in that yeah. I'll keep a I'll keep a short list of the books we recommend, and maybe we can keep a <laughs> running list. And in, in all our free time that we yeah, have, yeah, right. <laughs> when we're not <laughs> podcast we're not working, we can read. <laughs> so, uh, Cindy, when did monoclonal technology uh, come? Uh, what decade that they could start thinking about this? Do you roughly know? I don't remember. <laughs> Eight, so it was got to be seventies, right? I was in seventies because so. T cell I, engineering was the nineties, so it had to be like seventies or early eighties. Let's see. Monoclonal antibodies. Who invented monoclonal antibodies? 1975, Milstein and there Kohler, right? Yeah, I knew they won the Nobel Prize for that, yeah. 1984 Nobel Prize, yep. So 70s, and then once that came out, people immediately probably started thinking, how could we make these against tumors, right? Exactly. And so if, if, if we can identify proteins that are expressed on the surface of a tumor, preferentially or preferably exclusively, now you can develop an antibody that would target those cells. And uh, so, some of the ways that it's done is let the immune system recognize those tumor cells that now have antibody on them and let them attack it. So there's something called antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity, where different immune cells can recognize the the cells that are coated with antibody and kill them. Um, and the other way you can do it is you can tag a drug onto the antibody. And that way you're preferentially delivering the drug where you want it. So you can, like you were saying, Vincent, where you can inject into a vein and it'll go everywhere, but then the antibodies will concentrate in the tumor. And so they'll concentrate the drug in the tumor. So that's one way it was done. And, and one drug that's been used, that's this monoclonal antibody against tumors, and they'll become important, is something called rituximab. And it's, an, it's targeting a protein on the surface of a B cell called CD19. And so the idea here is you inject a patient that has a B cell tumor and the antibody will bind to the B cells. The immune system will attack those B cells and kill them and thereby killing the tumor. So that was really the first iteration of what immunotherapy was. And in fact, my dad was treated with rituximab. He had lymphoma. Oh, really? 
yeah, oh. a number of years ago. He didn't survive, but yeah, um, he, yeah, he was treated with rituximab, and oh. it was a it was a non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Yeah. So it should, it's, we should point out that these quote tumor specific proteins are actually not they're exactly right, they're normal self proteins that happen to be in, in this case on a B cell, right? Yeah. But but there really isn't anything unique on a tumor that we could target, right? Occasionally, there are antigens that get upregulated on a tumor that are not expressed in a normal adult. Mm-hmm. Okay. And but, so you could target them. And they're still, but they're still recognized as self, right? Uh, yes. So you'd have to put in, a, you'd have to infuse a monoclonal or do something because our our own yes you know, our system is not going to recognize it. Yeah, that's right. Well, and I and I think one of the kind of leading things that the the field is looking at is using this next generation sequencing technology to think about the fact, okay, cancer is a mutagenic event. There has to be, let's find those neoantigens or the antigens that aren't expressed on mm-hmm. self. And so taking solid tumors, metastatic tumors, and trying to delineate what is special about those tumors and then use the technologies that we're talking about now to direct those. Because right, a, a pan B cell marker like CD19 or a marker that's expressed on all B cells really can cause problems in addition to the good of removing a B cell malignancy. Yeah, that's right. The catch is it has to be something on the surface of a cell, right? At least for the type of therapy that we're going to talk about, as well as monoclonal antibody therapy or anything involving B cell recognition, you require that to be on the surface. Yeah. So, so this was so this was great. You had a way to to try and preferentially target things into a tumor, like a drug or this. Uh, antibody cell cytotoxicity. But then um, we started thinking about, well, you know, what is it about the tumor that the immune system isn't able to kill the tumor? And it turns out that the tumor is immunosuppressive. And so the tumor is really clever this way. It expresses molecules that shut down the immune system. So if a, if a T cell is revved up and ready to go in and kill the tumor, it gets there and gets the silencing signal from the tumor. How could our bodies, how could our <sighs> bodies deceive us like that? It's our own cells. It is. Right. And our it's not even a pathogen. Is, yeah, our immune system is designed to do this. So we think about the on signals for the immune system all the time, but we rarely think about the off signals. Mm. And there are a lot of them. I mean, we have to control the immune responses we have. Otherwise, you have a lot of pathology. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the pathology can often be worse than the disease. That happens a lot with viruses, right? The viruses go in and it's actually the immune system t- attacking the virally infected cells that cause more trouble than the virus itself sometimes. So, it, you know, we have these ways to regulate the immune system. And so what the, the cancer has done basically is take advantage of that. Somehow they figured out that, if well, if I put this molecule up on the surface of the tumor cell, now the immune system, when they come in, they're shut off and can't kill me. So, so this led to this idea of checkpoint inhibitors. And so this was, this has been for a number of years now, a buzzword and and huge thing in immunotherapy. And so these are mechanisms to um, treat with antibodies that target these molecules that normally shut off the T cells. And basically you interfere with the T cell getting the signal from the tumor. And so if you block this T cell getting the signal from the tumor, the T cell can maintain its ability to kill the tumor. And when it enters the tumor, it it, it eliminates the tumor cells. And so these are things that are called checkpoint inhibitors. And they have crazy names and they target two main molecules on the surface of T cells that are normally important for shutting down T cell responses. And these are called CTLA-4 and PD-1 if you you follow the nomenclature there. So the, their their discovery was huge, right? It was huge, really huge. Because that was immediately set, thought to be a way to 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 drive this kind of therapy, right? Absolutely. So are these two the main um, checkpoint inhibitors, or are there others? As far as I know, I think they're the two main ones that are out mm-hmm. there right now. So basically, the receptor is on a T cell. The ligand would be turned up on the surface of a tumor, right? Correct. Mm-hmm. And when that in- tumor interacted with the T cell, then it would shut off the T cell's ability right. to kill it, right? Right. So if you add these antibodies that will bind to this molecule in the T cell, it prevents the T cell from interacting with the signal it's getting. it would yeah. normally get from the tumor. And so these are... Are, are these checkpoint inhibitors 
approved now? I believe they are, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So the first one was approved in 2011, mm-hmm. um, and the second one was approved in 2014. So these have been on the market for a number of years I now. I see ads for them all the time. Absolutely. And um, I think Jimmy Carter was treated with one of these, right? Yes. Yes, he was. Yeah, there's there's one from Merck I keep seeing. What is that called? Your Boy? Is that the one? I'm not Her- sure. Let's see. I'm K, searching I, for it. K, K something. K, K something. It's like K-tuba. K-truda. 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 Yeah, it's a lung. I think it's a... It's K-truda, yeah. Checkpoint yeah. inhibitor. Yeah, I think they were... They, they and, and Pfizer, Pfizer were the first one to get uh, these approved, right? Yeah. Um, I think some of the things that after the approval and actually seeing a lot of patients not respond at all to checkpoint inhibitors... Basically, finding maybe 20%, you you could maybe have an increase in a population from 20% to 30% of people who had um, a decrease in tumors, but there's this huge population of people that just don't respond at all, and that could be because... Uh, reason Cindy mentioned the tumor microenvironment does not even allow the T cells to get there. So if they're not, if mm. there are not any T cells there, there's nothing to take the checkpoint off of. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's what also really led to trying to find other ways and other therapies like the CAR T cells to try to get at this another way. So Keytruda is pembrolizumab, the, the monoclonal yeah. you mentioned just now. So that's the PD-1. Yeah. Right. So that can obviously work in some cases as as long as there are T-cells around and you can get the monoclonal right. Right. at the tumor, right? Because some, some tumors are not going to be accessible. That's right. Hmm. That's right. And so one of the other immunotherapies that was also used um, for a while was trying to isolate the tumor uh, infiltrating lymphocytes or the T-cells directly from the tumor and grow them up ex vivo and then put them back in. And so this was without any of these other, you know, um, targeting mechanisms or realizing necessarily that the T cells, once they get put back in, we're going to get shut down or unable to get to the tumor. Mm. But the idea was there that we, we knew there were two, there were T cells in the tumors. You could take them out, you could put them back. And we had these ideas that these tumors had these breaks or we could target um, the tumors with antibodies. So people started thinking about how could we sort of put all of these things together? And so that's, that, and then I guess people got in a room and, and some <laughs> crazy ideas and maybe, you know, who knows what they they were drinking or whatever. And they came up with these crazy idea, well, why, why don't we, you know, just redirect these T-cells in a completely novel way? So these uh, efforts to pull T cells out of tumors that didn't work very well, I guess, right? It, I mean, it worked to some extent, but I mean, it was semi predictable. I mean, the, the T cells were there in the tumor, but once you made more of them ex vivo and put them back, they didn't all make it in the tumor. And when they got in the tumor, they got shut down. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. Because they had the you know, problem. These, yeah. So, the- so yeah. Uh, so so there was that. There was that whole thing. Um, but, the, but the idea was there that, you know, if you could get the T-cell in and if it didn't get the shutting down signals and, and if it had some way to specifically recognize the tumor, there was the potential to, to get these T-cells to kill these tumor cells. Mm-hmm. And it's T-cells that we want, right? That's the one that's going to get rid of the tumor. Right. So there's only two, there's two main uh, cell types in the body that, that have this capacity to go and kill a tumor cell. One is an NK cell and one is a T cell. And they kill by the same mechanism. An NK and so, cell, uh, for anyone who might not know, is just natural killer cells. So quite like its name, it kills yeah. things. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and to be honest, I, I think, you know, there's, there's people who study NK cells for a living for a very long time, but the reality is I think we know quite a bit more about the T cells and how they signal and how to, to control them. And right. so people have gone after the T cells this way. Um, so, so the idea was here, we got antibodies that can target tumors and they're extremely high affinity and they're great at recognizing these antigens, but they're soluble and even if they were on the surface of a B cell, which sometimes they are, and we can talk about that later at some point, but even even then, the B cells don't have the capacity to kill the tumor. So you've got right. these antibodies, and you've got these T cells that are great. They can they have all of these things inside of them that they can deploy and they can kill these tumor cells, but they really suck at recognizing the tumor. 
And so is there a way to kind of smush these things together? <laughs> and I, and so w- what people came up with was, well, why don't we take part of the antibody and put it on the T cell and make that recognize mm. the tumor? And so if, if our listeners remember back to the paper we did last month on Zika virus, they made these antibodies that were a small chain and bispecific and things. And so they, they had these ways to clone the specific region of an antibody that recognizes an antigen. And so we have this capacity to clone, clone these fragments and then fuse them. And so we said, well, why don't we just make the T cell receptor instead of recognizing antigen the way it normally does? Why don't we make it recognize antigen the way an antibody does? So they take the fragment of what the antibody is recognizing, it, it recognize, but the way it recognizes the antigen, this fragment of the antibody, and fuse it to the T-cell receptor, and then put that back in the T-cells and put them back into the patient. So maybe you could tell us about T-cell receptors. Yes. So, yes. So <laughs> this is where we have to get a little technical. So if your eyes bug out, you know, just st- bear with us a little bit. So <laughs> We'll so come back around at the end. Yeah. So here's the primer on T cells to be able to understand exactly how all this works. So we have two types of T cells. We have CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells. And what we're really talking about are CD8 T cells. And so when we talk about CD4, CD8, CD19, what these are, are CD stands for cluster of differentiation. And what that means is many years ago, before we had all the ability to know the DNA sequences and RNA sequences of all these genes, what we had were the ability to inject these things into animals, isolate out the antibodies that recognize these, and cluster cells into groups that were recognized by different sets of antibodies. And so they were clusters of differentiation. So this one cluster, CD4, were all recognized by this one cluster of antibodies all recognize the same type of cell. And CD8 recognized a different cell. What we know now, because we have a lot more information, is that CD4 is a specific protein that's expressed on a subset of T cells. And CD8 is a protein that's expressed on another subset of T cells. And these uh, are called co-receptors because the actual T cell receptor um, is is called the T cell receptor. And it recognizes fragments of proteins that are presented in the context of something called major histocompatibility complex or MHC. So this gets this is a little bit confusing and a lot of verbiage here. But what happens is, for example, if we're talking about a tumor, the tumor has antigens in it. It chops them up. It puts them in these little things called MHC, and it pops them up onto the surface. And if a T cell receptor can see that fragment in that MHC, it will be directed to do something against that cell. So if we have a CD8 T cell, these CD8 T cells are called cytotoxic. That's why we want them for this CAR T cell therapy, because they have these... uh, basically weapons that they can deploy on the cell to kill the target cell. And so if they see their antigen in this little MHC, then they're going to deploy their weapons and kill the tumor cell. So is it correct to say that um, the, all these CD8 T cells that are flowing through us and doing surveillance of peptides in these MHCs, I like to think of them of hot dogs and hot dog buns sitting on the exactly. surface. Exactly, right? it's perfect, yep. If if they say, oh, this is something I recognize from day one, they leave it alone, right? So if it's self, nothing happens. Mm-hmm. But when it's foreign, that's the thing that sets them off. That's and, right. And something foreign is something they, had, they didn't see when the child was developing and its, and its thymus was developing and all that, right? That's right. Okay, so we have a lot of different T cell receptors in us, just like we have lots of different so, antibodies, right? Yes, we do, and that's that's something we can cover another time. But it is spectacular that how our immune system develops this repertoire of cells that can recognize millions and millions of different things, right. and both T cells can do this, and B cells can do this. Well, I was um, thinking, you know, the steps involved for recognizing self versus non-self. I mean, usually always there's actually one, there's more than one, more than two steps because you can't have, 
your cells recognizing things and, and having a reaction to yourself. So usually there's a lot of other co-receptors involved with mm. um, either a TCR or a T-cell receptor complex that has to have this lock and key mechanism so that you don't attack self and you're really sure if you're going to, you know, employ this infl inflammatory response that you're sure it's something that's pathogenic or a tumor. So we'll talk a little I, I bit about that I think we ought more. to do a self non-self episode. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. It cool. would be great title it, names. We could come and it's, <laughs> and, and the, and the problem is, is it's never black and white. And that is right. going to be the hardest thing for the listeners on this uh, <laughs> podcast and the hardest thing for the immunologists here to try to describe because everything has an exception. And what you were saying, Vincent is right where, you know, if, if a cell saw something during development it's going to say, okay, I'm not going to respond to that. And in fact, we have a mechanism to just sort of make sure they never even make it out kill of them. the they, thymus. They, they, yeah, kill them, right? yeah. they kill them, they kill themselves. Yeah. But, but we know that, that some of these can get out. We have autoimmune disease, right? Mm, right. It, mm -hmm. it happens. You bet. So, yep. so, the so just fails. right. It fails. And so this is where that regulation comes in and really important. So what Stephanie was saying about, you know, making sure we have multiple fail safes and multiple signals that need to be engaged for these cells to be deplo deploying their other armament of weapons is important. So, so you said what what they decided to do was take some antibody, the combining site, right. and combine it with a T cell receptor. Right, because the problem with this hot dog in a bun and this MHC and this antigen presentation and all this kind of stuff, the problem is is that everybody has different MHCs, and we can talk about that another time too. It's it is the most polymorphic gene in our genome, so there's lots of different versions of it, and everybody has different ones. And so, if you're trying to think about uh, some sort of therapy that we can use multiple people, it's never going to work. Right, and so everybody's presenting different peptides in their MHC molecules. And so it gets really muddy. And so the idea was, well, can we take these really potent CD8 T cells that are good at killing things and use these antibodies that we know we've already been able to use to target tumor cells and put them together? So what they wanted to do was take a chunk of the antibody. So B cells make antibodies. And they... The cool thing is, is that the antibodies are not restricted to this MHC presentation or anything else or, or, or this, this chopping up of proteins and into little peptides and putting in the MHC. None of that is required. Antibodies can recognize things on the surface of cells and, and they can, you know, just do their thing to what we call native antigens. The other cool thing is that they, um, they can also recognize things like nucleic acids, lipids, sugars, and proteins, whereas T cells can only recognize proteins. So if you if you bring in this B cell part of it, you really widen your field of play of what you what you can try and target. So you're not even using the T cell receptor as anything but a an anchor, right? Right. You're using it to drive the signaling part of it. Okay. So so when we think about a receptor, we think about the the part that's outside of the cell binding to something. And that's a ligand or an antigen or whatever it may be. And then that protein goes through the membrane. It's called the transmembrane domain. And then it goes into the inside of the cell, what we call the cytosol. And it's that inside part that's absolutely critical. Because when the outside part binds to its ligand or antigen, somehow there's a physical transfer of information to the inside of the cell that then signals that cell. And so in the case of a T cell, when the T cell receptor sees its peptide MHC, it, it transmits a signal through some other proteins that we don't need to go into the details about, but it transmits signals into the cell that tells the cell, you saw something you need to activate and kill. And so it mobilizes the little vesicles that has inside of its uh, cytoplasm and discharges them out to where, where it was contacting the other cell. And so then it kills the other cell. It seems like a leap of faith to assume that making this uh, chimeric receptor would still work that way, right? <laughs> Absolutely. And who knew it could? I mean, seriously, you're taking one part of the B cell, uh, you know, the antibody, the B cell receptor, and just chunking it on to the T cell receptor and saying, pray, let's, let's see if it works. <laughs> but it did. 
So <laughs> it's amazing. It's absolutely astounding that this works. But so so you now have this fusion of this little chunk of a, of an antibody to this transmembrane domain and the signaling part of the T cell receptor. And and so what happens now is And that's the car part of the This is the chimeric antigen receptor, right? So mm-hmm. this is the this is the sci-fi world where we took the part of the B cell receptor and part of the T cell receptor, put them together and made this chimera. Never existed in nature. It still doesn't, except for our synthetic version of it. This is not something that a, a cell would ever make or a human would ever make or any other animal would make for that matter. Mm. So this is totally, somebody came up with this in their in their brain and they, and they did this. But what it now does is it allows this really high affinity antibody part to target what you want it to target. And then it activates a T cell and the T cell kills the tumor. Mm. So the That's first way they did this was they said, okay, well, we know what, what works really well. Well, if we take this anti-CD19 antibody, monoclonal antibody, we put it into people with B-cell tumors, it kills the B-cell tumor. So let's take the chunk of that antibody and let's fuse it on the T-cell. And we put, you know, they, take, they have to harvest a patient's T-cells. And then they take this fusion construct, they take the DNA, they made this sci-fi version of this chimeric receptor, and they transfect it into the cells. So that means they put that DNA into the t- patient's T-cells. So the patient's T-cells now express this ant- this new protein, this novel protein. Then they have to grow them up in out, outside of the body, so you get lots of them. And then they put them back in the patient, and they cross their fingers, and they see what happens. So do they, that- do they purify CD8 or just total... T lymphocytes. So that's a great question. Uh, originally, they just said, let's get the effector T cells. There, That means the CD8 T cells, the mature ones, mm. because they already have all of these weapons that they can deploy. Um, but now people are starting to get much more sophisticated. They're looking at more um, stem-like cells and then differentiating them in vitro mm. or letting mm. them back and differentiate in vivo. And then there is a mess of various different types of T cells. We have memory T cells that have right. already responded to things. We have naive T cells that haven't yet responded. And then there's lots of different kinds of memory cells. So different people are taking these the, and purifying these various different populations of T cells and then putting that back yeah. in. I would assume that, so thinking about starting from a T cell that's naive, it probably has more potential to proliferate than a memory cell or a, a memory effector cell. Is that what is seen that they're looking at is the naive T cells? Uh, have they gotten into that or is that still developing, finding so, out which type? So they're, they're, it's still developing. Mostly they're going towards the memory cells because they, they can expand them ex vivo. Okay. Um, and they, and they do have more effector function. Although, you know, there, like you said, there are advantages to using these naive T cells. So, for example, let's say if, unfortunately, you got influenza this year and it was a new version that you hadn't seen before and there were new T cells that need to get activated in order to kill the flu. Those are those naive T cells. They haven't seen anything before. And so it takes them a little while to get up and going. And it, ta- it takes them a little while to synthesize all of these weapons to be able to deploy them on the infected cells. And so it just takes longer for those cells to come up to speed. However, if you got infected with a flu that you had seen before or that you were immunized against, if you were smart and got your flu vaccine this year, then um, those T cells already are um, primed to go and they have all of their effector molecules and they can deploy them very rapidly. And so it's a trade-off between do we want to go for a naive cell or do we want to go for a memory cell? Mm. This advantage of a naive cell is remember we have, we talked about this already, we have these checks we have these fail safes and these multiple steps that the, t- the cells need to receive multiple signals in order to be activated. And so those naive cells still have those requirements. Mm. And so now if you put these chimeric receptors into those naive T cells, they still need the signals in order to be activated because if you just get um, the signal through the T cell receptor, it doesn't activate the cells enough. And I think I said that the opposite. What I meant to say, yes, of course, an effector memory and a memory T cell is going to have a greater capacity to proliferate, proliferate if it has, um, if it's seen the antigen or the pathogen for the second time. But I'm thinking in terms of a naive T cell where what you're saying is those co-stimulatory 
co-receptors and receptors have not been activated. So potentially their baseline stimulation levels are lower, meaning yes. maybe there's a higher, there's a h- increased ability to proliferate in the future. I guess that's what I was thinking of. No. Maybe I okay. said that Fair. backwards. But. Yeah. Cindy, yeah. something you said earlier, kind of a throwaway comment. You said, you know, you take out the T-cells and you grow them. At one time, we, <laughs> at one time we didn't know how to grow T cells, right? <laughs> you did not to do that. No, we do know, and that that's a that's a whole another can of worms that we can open. But immune cells uh, um, talk to each other with something called cytokines, and they these are growth factors for immune cells, um, and they do a lot of other things too. They're just for ways to sell, cells to talk to each other. But one of the ways that T cells make more copies of themselves as they get a signal that says proliferate. And that's through something called interleukin-2 or IL-2. And so if you feed these T-cells IL-2 in culture, you know, they'll grow and they'll make more copies of themselves. So that, so you know, each step of this whole amazing process to get these CAR T-cells is based on fundamental discoveries in basic immunology. Yes, basic research. If Every not, single if, step. If I'm not mistaken, it was... Bob Gallo, who figured out you needed IL-2 to grow T-cells, and that eventually led to being able to grow HIV in T-cells right. as well. You know, so it's, right. all, it's all, you know. All interconnected. Interconnected, yeah. So the Six, first CAR T-cells, was there, were they successful and did, are there right. newer there was ones? A little, there's a little oops in the first ones <laughs> because they thought, well, let's just fuse it to um, the signaling parts of the T-cell receptor. And... Um, the problem with that is, remember, we said there are these fail safes and you need more than one signal to activate the T cells. Well, if you activate just the T cell receptor without these things called co-stimulation, the T cell actually shuts down <laughs> and it becomes energic. And so this is called signal one without signal two. So we need both signals for the T cells to proliferate. So then we got smarter <laughs> and... <laughs> And what they did was they said, okay, well, that didn't work. So we'll just add something else to the cytoplasmic part of this construct. And so what they did was they took the co-stimulatory fragment from the cytosol, uh, from the the co-stimulatory molecule, the part that signals in the cytosol, and they just stuck that on. And it worked. (laughs) So that... So it was able to signal through both the T-cell receptor fragment that was on there and the co-stimulatory fragment that was on. They just keep chunking things on and they all, they all work. It's amazing. So when you, say, sure. when you say they work, do, you, do they look at this in animals first? Or uh, you know, you can do this in cell culture. Okay. And I guess, and I didn't, I didn't go back and look at each part of the literature this way of how they came about um, making these different versions of these things. But my guess is they were a- able to screen in vitro. Okay. Um, just add on: Do we need a linker? Do we not need a linker? How much of the cytoplasmic tail do we need? Do we need this whole molecule or part of the molecule? And there's probably thousands of different iterations of these things that various different labs did before they got it right. But for us, it seems like, oh, well, they just stuck it on at work. <laughs> but so, so the second generation of these CAR T cells, they got better. They put this, you know, this co-stimulatory fragment on and they had the T cell receptor on and they had the transmembrane domain and they had the single chain antibody fragment from the, that recognizes the CD19 and voila, it works. And so um, there, it, it really is amazing. You put them in, they, they eliminate the, the B cells completely. Then they ran into another little problem. And so everybody thought that um, if you put these things in, they would do a little bit and then they'd die. But it turns out that one of the very first, first people who got this infusion, it's been 10 years. Wow. They still have CAR T cells. And guess what? Not a single antibody, not a single B cell in their whole body. Which would cause so, problems if they get, some, you know, infected that's right. or something. So these, what you're saying is this: these original patients still have the infused CAR T cells. They do, and they that's do. so weird because you didn't put in any stem cells, which are supposed to give rise to these, right? So these are so memory it, cells. Yeah, long-lived memory cells. Is that essentially what they concluded? That's what I understand. They are long-lived mm-hmm. memory cells, and so so obviously it's not a good thing that you don't. So it's a good thing this person no longer has B cell cancer. But the bad thing is they don't have any B cells. <laughs> <laughs> so, so do they get lots of infections? So what they do is they have to get infusions of antibodies, uh, antibodies yeah. 
couple of weeks. Yeah. And that's a lot of going to the hospital every two weeks to make sure you have antibodies to fight off infection. Yes. I remember, uh, I remember a, a, a story we did on TWIV where that had a patient who had been immunosuppressed and had to get antibodies regularly. And it, they ended up getting polio because the polio antibodies they were getting weren't good enough. There was some problem with their titer. You know? oh, God. So lots of issues, right? You have to know, know what's going to be assaulting people and make sure yeah. they're right and what is right. You know, you never know. Right, right. Yeah. And with that patient, he didn't seem to have any complications in terms of his body overreacting to the CAR T cells. His body seemed to accept them and use them. I mean, 10 years is a long time. Yeah. So, so I don't, I don't, I'm not going to claim that there were no side effects at the beginning uh, gotcha. because we'll get gotcha. to, we'll get to these things. They're, they're pretty dangerous actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, that you unleash these, these T cells into the body doing this uh, business that they're doing. But yeah, so, so each iteration of this, we get a little smarter, right? And so, so somebody said, well, you know, maybe we don't want to just leave them in there. Um, and the other thing is, mm -hmm. is if, if these CAR T cells go in and they start, attacking things that we didn't expect them to attack. Because remember, we don't have normally antigens that are specific to a tumor and nothing else. Mm. So you put in these T cells and they could start going, causing trouble where you don't want them to be. So people got smarter. They said, well, let's put a kill switch in. And so what they do is they put in a, like a, a toxic gene or a gene that will kill a cell if you give a drug that won't harm a normal cell. And so they've used things like um, the herpes simplex virus thymidine kinase, which will go into cells and it doesn't cause a problem. But if you give the drug and cyclovir, now it'll mm -hmm. kill those cells. Mm -hmm. so, so if they engineer now, so now they've got the single chain antibody fragment, the transmembrane domain, the T cell receptor, the co-receptor. And now if you put in this cytotoxic gene that's also expressed, now if these T cells start causing a problem, you can give the drug and bam, the T cells are gone. Mm. So that's great. Very right? smart. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's amazing, you, you know, you start digging into what's going on here and things just get cooler and cooler and more sophisticated. And like you said, it came from basic immunological research, you know, in academic centers. I think there was a Absolutely. senator, some senator that said, you know, the biggest breakthroughs in biomedical research come from companies. And of course, not to say that they don't have breakthroughs as well, but I think it's basic research and understanding mechanisms that gets us to this very cool point. Right. For sure. And the thing is, is you don't know where two fields are going to collide and have something amazing happen. Right. Yeah. Right. And so so keeping your eyes broad and reading broadly is so critically important. I like what uh, Vincent says. He says, find good people, just give them money and let them do the science. <laughs> See what make, they come yeah. up with. Hey, make me head of NIH. That's what I'll do. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's your future. <laughs> I don't think so. But, you know, this and plus herpes simplex TK, you know, yeah. people. Yeah. Worked on that for years. Right. And you could say, why are you doing this? You know, we know what it does for the virus, but it turns out to be really useful in and, and many more ways than just this, too. I mean, it's Absolutely. just it's incredible. You really you have to let people just be curious. And you have to you have to have different types of people like you need people who are their whole life goal is to work on this HSV thymidine kinase, right? right? They need to understand it inside and out. And then you need people who can step back and say, hey, that's a cool paper. Wait, can I use that and put it on this over here yeah. from what somebody else is doing? And then combine all those things together and make these crazy, crazy new ideas and, and new therapies and completely different from what anybody was thinking about. Yeah, which, go, which is basically, it's hard to predict, as you said. You know, where things right. converge. The idea that you can predict, and, and often we're asked to in our grant applications, predict you know, where this is going. Who knows? Just do good science. It'll work. We've known that. It always turns out to be the case. Right. So, so I just, yeah, go ahead. Uh, one of the things I listen to, this sports radio station, and they have uh, the James cancer center out of Ohio state, I have been hearing a lot more about immunotherapy and the blessings of it and how it's going to work for everybody. And I understand that's a good marketing tool, but what are some of the drawbacks? Because it can't work for everyone. Right. 
So the one of the big problems is that everything I've talked about so far and the, the first gen, second gen, this, that, and the other, it's all targeting these liquid tumors. So right. when we talk about a liquid tumor, we're talking about leukemia or lymphoma. So it's an immune cell, not a solid tumor. Mm-hmm. And so you infuse something in the blood and those T cells are going to easily reach those leukemia cells and they're, you know, they're floating around the body, they're in a lymph node or they're doing their thing. And the original problem we were talking about at the beginning is that it's hard to get the immune cells into the tumor. Mm -hmm. And once they get in the tumor, they get shut down. So this has not really panned out that well for solid tumors. Mm. So the antigen is more challenging. So if you've got a bunch of B cells and you can kill off anybody who's expressing CD19 and obviously this patient can survive 10 years without any B cells, just getting antibody infusions, you're okay. But if you're now going to target a, an antigen that's on a solid tumor that's also expressed elsewhere in the body, you're going to get what's called on-target, off-tumor toxicity. And this is something that is mm. unique to therapies like immunotherapies where antibodies or CAR T cells are targeting an antigen that is supposed to be preferentially, quote unquote, expressed on a tumor. Right. And so they're doing what they're supposed to do. It's just not where you wanted it to be. And so there are examples where they've infused um, these CAR T cells that have different targeting components. So they're not necessarily targeting CD19, they're targeting different antigens. And all of a sudden they find out, oh, oops, that was expressed on the lung when lung, I thought it was yeah. only in the prostate. Or that was right. expressed in the brain when I only thought it was expressed in the lung. Or I thought it was in breast tissue and now what's happening to their liver. So, so we get these surprises. And so these T cells are really potent. And that's one of the reasons why they have these kill switches. Um, and the other problem that you have is that uh, um, Vincent was talking about escape in the tumors escape and they, they can escape these CAR T cells too. Mm -hmm. And so if you're That's targeting so CD19 and they downregulate CD19, they become resistant. Hmm. So it's you're back to the beginning. And so there's, there's something that I found that I thought was really cool that newer things are trying to put two together and they're requiring an and signal. So this is this idea of Boolean logic where you have to have something that's on a tumor and something else that's on a tumor. And A might also be on one tissue and B might be on another tissue, but you need A and B together in order to signal and kill. Okay. And so they've, they've done this or they have a not signal, something that's normally expressed on a healthy cell and not expressed on a tumor cell. So if you have the plus signal and you get a minus signal, that means it's a healthy tissue, but a plus signal without the minus signal, that's an unhealthy tissue and you kill that. So they're using this, I, you know, this Boolean logic that they use in like programming or whatever to, to turn on or turn off or tweak or, you know, uh, really um, fi more finely target a tumor specifically. And how would you make two specificities, just two different receptors on the T cell? Yeah. So, so you can make two different cars. Yeah. And so one is going to uh, target CD19 and one will target something else. And basically what they do is they put half of the signaling part on one and half the signaling part on the other. And you need to target, you need to trigger both in order to activate the T cell. Right. Remind me, why doesn't, when you do this CAR T cell therapy, why doesn't, why don't the cells get exhaustion from PD? Uh, I think they can. Um, I think they can. And so people are trying to, for example, combine mm. checkpoint inhibitors with CAR T cells nice. to keep the cars running. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very good. <laughs> oh, that's a good title. <laughs> <laughs> so this would be similar to, the uh, this new approach would be similar to the bi-specific antibodies we talked about in the last right. podcast. So you want two right. things to be recognized in order right. for the effector function to happen. And then if you want... <clears throat> The other situation, uh, something that's not going to work, something that is on a normal cell but not on a tumor, how would you do that? Right. So, so <laughs> they take advantage of these checkpoints and they, they, they fuse that targeting molecule to the checkpoint signaling part that shuts the T cell off. Got it. 
nice. It's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> very cool. Yeah. So, so the, so they're great and they can also be used for other things. And I don't want to go into great detail on this and we, maybe we need to do a second episode on this. Um, but, but people are start, starting to think outside of cancer. So autoimmune diseases can be malfunctioning T cells or B cells. And if we could target them and, and eliminate them, that's another way that CAR T cells could be used. Mm, neat. Yeah. Yeah. Because, for example, in multiple sclerosis, it's T cells that are recognizing uh, part of um, the myelin sheath that's wrapping around neurons and attacking them. If we could attack the T cells that are attacking the neurons, then we could kill those and eliminate them and, and alleviate the disease. So you could do so that with a CAR T cell? You could do that with a CAR T cell. So you could actually make an antibody that recognizes specifically the T cell receptor that's causing the, the of the T cells that are causing the problem mm -hmm. and target them mm -hmm. specifically. Mm -hmm. right. So there's really no limit to what you can target. You you mentioned here in the notes about a fungal infection. You can even that's do right. infectious diseases, right? So I, I I thought this was cool because what they did was they fused what's called a part of a pattern recognition receptor, and and we'll get into that when we talk about immune 101. But basically, it's a receptor that's designed to recognize something foreign, and so in this case, it's a receptor that's designed to recognize fun f a fungus. It's called Dectin-1. And so they took this idea of the CAR T cell, instead of fusing to a single-chain antibody that recognizes CD19, they just took the binding domain of this pattern recognition receptor that recognizes fungi and put that on there. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. fungi are large, and if the T cell comes in and recognizes the sugar through this pattern recognition receptor, then they discharge their killing mechanisms on the fungus. Mm. Yeah. Mm. It's very cool. That's great. That's very cool. And they also done this with HIV. So HIV infects CD4 T cells. So if you could target CD4 T cells and eliminate them, you would tar you eliminate the cells that are infected and, and harboring the virus. And so they've made CAR T cells that are targeting CD4. And so you can target any CD4 T cell and eliminate it and preferentially eliminate HIV. Mm -hmm. Now, we all know that that's not the only reservoir. They sit in macrophages right. and other things. So it's not perfect, but it could dramatically reduce viral load. The problem is that in many of the long-lived T cell reservoirs, there's no viral protein on the cell surface, right? They're silent. And right. so, so these CAR T cells wouldn't ever see them. See them, yeah. They wouldn't, they wouldn't see the virus, but they see CD4 because CD4 is always expressed on the T cell. So you're just going to get rid of all CD4 T cells. So then, <clears throat> yes. but, okay, you'd have uh, the same issue... Of AIDS, then you right. you would you would deplete, yes, but right, presumably right. Then it would recover. Mm. Hmm. Hmm. Well, and I think it's kind of where we're looking into very personalized medicine. I think Vincent had brought. He really wants to see where you would look at a mirror. It would scan your body. That's right. It would tell you what type of cancer or what your you know malignancies are and and designate what your treatments would be. I think mm. this if you, cancer immunotherapy is probably the closest right now we are to personalized medicine, which of course comes with a lot of cost um, in terms of yes. money involved with it. But it's it's very neat to see how far we've come. And of course, I think the next step is finding out why some people don't respond and and why tumors, uh, you know, hide their CD19 and, and why some of these people actually don't go into remission um, based on some of the mechanisms that we learn. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing we should point out is that these more recent CAR T cell therapies don't use transfection anymore, but they use actually HIV derived viral vectors to deliver they the genes. Do. Right? <laughs> Isn't that they cool? They do. <laughs> they make virus and then they infect with the virus. And and I think the advantage there is anybody who's done these wet bench experiments, transfection isn't usually very efficient. And yeah. actually, it's pretty horrible when you talk about primary cells oh, yeah, taken out sure. of the yeah. patient. Right. But Unfortunately, or fortunately, HIV and uh, you know lentiviruses and retroviruses are really good <laughs> at infecting even primary cells. And so, yeah, they make these viruses and then they infect in 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 the culture, and you get almost a hundred percent of the cells expressing these. And that's and what I, I I love to point out. You you have this scourge of humanity, HIV, right? <laughs> Which we have modified to use for gene delivery. How right, cool right. is that? How cool it's is that? It's amazing. Awesome. It's amazing. Yeah, I love it. So what, what do we have approved right now, Cindy? 
So there are um, two that ha- two car therapies that have been approved. Mm-hmm. One was um, Kimria by Novartis, and that was in uh, August of 2017. So these are very, very, very new. And the other one is called Yeskarta by Kite Pharmaceuticals, which I believe was just bought by Gilead for $12 billion. <laughs> uh, and that was in October of 2017. And so, so there are two of these therapies out there. Um, they're both for B cell lymphomas, and they're both targeting CD19. Mm-hmm. And, that, and as, they must be slightly different, so that each company can do their I, own. Right? I think they're they are they are slightly different, but they both use the same basic idea. I think if it has a slightly different sequence, it's it's going to be a different drug, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. So. It's interesting that it's approved for children and young adults. So I wonder, I mean, what is it about, I mean, they, that, does that mean they couldn't use it in adults? I mean, I see that the Yaskarta right. can be for adults, but it's interesting. It must be, you know, how naive their B cells are. And I think. Um, I, their I don't immunological know. age, maybe. So I think the reason why they did this was a couple of things, and maybe maybe listeners can clarify this if they yeah, have more if information. There's any clinicians out there. But I think one is that this is such a horrible disease for these young children right. that they get this lymphoma, and it it's. It's ac- it's one of the easiest ones to cure, which seems why would that be a target, right? So I think you can cure about 80% of these children with traditional chemotherapy. Okay. The problem is, is those 20% that don't relapse mm-hmm. and they'll die. Mm-hmm. Right. And it right. is, is horrible for these little kids. And so this is designed for those refractory um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia in these little kids um, because it's it's just a desperate attempt to try and save them. And they have right. these B cells and the B cells express CD19. So that's who they targeted with that original mm-hmm. therapy. Hmm. So do you know what's in the pipeline? I don't, but I, as far as I understand, there is like 20 or 30 different um, clinical trials going on right now with various different versions of CAR Ts for, for different types of um, both lymphoma and leukemia, as well as now solid tumors. Hmm. So they're trying to target the solid tumors. And they did, and so, so one of these ways to target the solid tumors is try to overcome these immunosuppressive environments. So one way to do that is to combine it with the monoclonal antibodies targeting checkpoint inhibitors. Another way to do it is they've made something called an armored car. <laughs> it's like an armored tank <laughs> where are they going to express a molecule or an enzyme that's going to shut down um, the suppressive environment of the tumor? So it inactivates one of the molecules that the tumor secretes that shuts down a T cell response. Mm-hmm. Or the T cell now expresses an enzyme that allows it to degrade the tissue and get into the tumor better. And so these are ways that they're sort of armoring up the T cell to, to keep it intact and get into that tumor microenvironment so it can actually do its do its job. Hmm. Neat. Yeah. Very neat. You could also, I guess, use this for transplantation purposes, right? If you want to target the the cells that are rejecting the organ. I guess I hadn't thought about that. It's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I guess you could if if you knew the targets. Um, I I'm not sure in the case of a graft versus host disease. Mm whether you'd be able to distinguish between the host T cells and the graft T cells to target right. the graft T cells specifically. I can't right or now maybe off the top of my it, head think of how you would do that, but I'm sure somebody's yeah. clever enough to figure it out. It's probably like what you said before that you would just get rid of all C D nineteen cell and you know, cells hope for the and best. hope for the best you solve that problem and then okay, maybe they have to get, you know, antibody passive transfer, but at least may, maybe that's the strategy. Mm. Yeah. And I and I guess you usually ablate the patient first before you give them the graft. So in the case of bone marrow transplant, for sure, you do that. So most of the cells that are going to be there are going to be of um, the graft origin. So I guess that's, that's how you could target it. So, Cindy, uh, last thing, how much does this cost? 
<laughs> so unfortunately, dun, dun, dun. And, and, and we've taught, we mentioned this uh, before and you've mentioned it on your other podcast as well. Right now it's between 300 and $500,000 per person. It's a one-time thing, so you could argue, well, you only have to do it once. If it works, it's great, it and you're saved. Um, that's just the therapy, and that's not the hospital stuff and everything this, else, right? <laughs> this, is, this is the big thing, because it's not just the treatment. These, these are incredibly powerful and incredibly dangerous, and the types of side effects that come with this are entirely new territory. So it's not at all like what you see with chemotherapy. You're not losing your hair and having some intestinal issues and your skin is getting dry and sloughing. These are, you are powerfully activating the immune system to go and, and kill lots of cells quickly. And so there's two things. One, you can have this on target off tumor attacking organs that it's not supposed to be attacking. But the other thing that you have is that the T cells, when they're doing the right thing in the right place at the right time, they're killing a lot of cells fast. Right. And when you do that, you release things mm. that alert the immune system to the fact that there's a damage and there's tissue repair that needs to happen. And this induces a massive inflammatory response and we get something called a cytokine storm response. And so there's this massive production of all these inflammatory cytokines that trigger a whole bunch of different sequelae. Um, blood pressure drops, temperature drops, you get edema, and all these other um, systemic effects that are really hard to control. And so it, it requires a lot of um, physician time to treat these patients as well and manage their um, the, the tumor response that they're supposed to have comes at this cost that they have to manage. Mm, yeah. So right now, I, I assume since it's licensed, people are being treated using. As far these, as I know, right? yes, they are. Yep. I mean, so who's paying for it? I have, don't know. <laughs> you, you either have really wealthy people only, which is not right, or the insurance companies have to make a decision whether they're going to pay for this, right? That's hmm. right. And it's a, right. so that you know, with technology comes this issue that it it costs a lot of money. That um, it does, and, it, and our um, healthcare system is. Got a few problems. Yeah, um, it's not really in a place where it's going to support people who come out of poverty having cancer being able to treat themselves with this. No. So we could only hope that with more research and development dollars going into clinical trials, that we'll know more, the production will be less, and eventually that'll trickle down. But unfortunately, what that means is today, the people who are suffering, there's a cost to that. It's unfortunate because I think anything developed by humanity should be available to everyone, right? Yeah. In theory, but it's not, and it's really unfortunate. Because right, all- because really, in this country, you know, to stand on the morals of equal access to, ha- or equal happiness for all people, it would just be equal access to health care that is equivalent to that. Unfortunately, you, it's, a, yeah. it's a political issue, right? Right. <laughs> and some people, believe, some people believe that, and others do not, you know? It's really right. amazing uh, that a number of people feel that Everyone should not be entitled to government right. subsidized health care. The the other issue is that when the one of these companies, when it was licensed, one of the one of the officials of a company went online saying, Well, it's expensive, but it's gonna save your life which I thought was really not nice. Irresponsible. Because Who's his PR person? He's it, gotta it was a C, it was a CEO of one of he's, the companies. He's and the go thing to is seminar. what you should say is, well, we spent three billion dollars on this and we have to recover it. And then once we do, maybe we could lower the price. That would be the reasonable thing to say, but no, you know. And there are gonna be more of these, so it's gonna be an issue going forward, right? Right. Yeah. Well, well, Cindy, I think you did a great job great. explaining it. I really, <laughs> um, you know, I've done, I've known about this. I've done a lot of reading, but I think you really succinctly brought it together in a package that made sense for people. And of course they can let us know, but it, it went a little deep, but then we came back up for air. We described things and I, I think you did a great job. Thank you. Yeah, it was lovely. I yeah. loved researching it. It was really fun. <laughs> like you, Steph, I, I had known about this and I sort of knew generally what it was in the, in the chimeric receptor, but sure. digging deeper and seeing all these incredibly creative ways that people have tweaked this system and the amazing way that all of these basic biomedical findings are just have come together in this package that now offers hope. 
right. to people who didn't have hope. And right. I think it's fantastic. So I have a, I'm teaching now my virology course. The last lecture of the course, when it's not till May, is on gene therapy. And I'm, this is going to yeah. go in it because great. it's brand new and it's a great, you know, there aren't many approved gene therapy examples and uh, no. just a handful of them. And this is a great one. To, and, the, you know, the science behind it is just cool. Right. You can't, you just can't deny it. It's just great. (laughs) And one thing before we move on, I did just want to touch on one of the interesting things that they're looking into is the effect of the microbiome and immunotherapy. Mm. And and in our lab, we do work with the microbiome and its effects during a viral infection in neonates or in young animals. And so I posted in a paper and maybe we could share it, but what they saw was that in melanoma patients receiving the checkpoint inhibitor, pretty sure it was PD-L1 or PD-1, PD-L1. And they, showed that people who had a higher diversity of bacteria, and that included um, having species from the genus Rumococcus, rum, I'm sorry, Ruminococcus, which is in the class of Clostridia. And I tell you, Clostridium, people who study that, that is a fascinating bacteria. It seems to be very much in, in good uh, uh, situations, it behaves in the bad situations, it can really cause problems. So, you know, how the microbiome affects how we treat cancer patients, I think, is another new frontier in personalized medicine. So I posted that in there. I just thought it was really fascinating. Neat. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Kind of makes your head explode when you just yeah, think about does. all these things that can connect together. And you, it, it's impossible to keep all those moving pieces um, up in the air and trying to figure out how to treat these patients. We, we basically just look at one thing at a time and then try and connect it back. But right. that bigger systems biology approach to understanding how all this works is just mind boggling. So for, pe- for people in training, for young people looking to be scientists, there's a lot out there that to be excited about. I think what is going to be the limiting um, step is, uh, is there space for everyone to do that cool science and is there money for that? Yeah. Should we do a few emails? Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's do a few. All right, uh, Cindy, maybe you could take that first one from Matt. Okay, so Matt writes, Dear immuno, immune, immune knowledge. knowledge-ists. It's cute. Knowledge. Nice. Yeah, that's cute. I have listened to TWIV for about two years and nearly wrote in last year after <laughs> my virology final exam, but never got around to sending it. That's a shame. You should do that. <laughs> in, the, in that draft, I had written how I wished that there was an immunology podcast I could listen to because immunology is just about the coolest subject out there. Woohoo! I think we agree with that. In <laughs> fact, I would specifically keep an eye out for any TWIV episodes that were relate, related to immunology. I'm so excited for this podcast and I'm eagerly awaiting episodes episode three. So this was a little earlier. I'm in my last semester as an undergrad at the University of Wisconsin and actually just submitted my applications for pursuing my PhD in immunology. Congratulations. Thus, I look forward to hearing from Steph's grad student perspective. I had a few thoughts in response to the first two episodes. Firstly, I was glad that the proposed tax plan was a point of discussion. It's my understanding that the Senate tax bill does not tax tuition waivers while the House bill does. Feel free to correct me. I'm not sure if this is accurate. Um, regardless, I thought it was a rather dark coincidence that grad school deadlines were one to two days before the bill was passed. I'm sure that, like me, many other prospective grad students had the tax bill weighing heavily in their minds. I'm also curious if there were prospective applicants that decided not to Mm. pursue grad school in light of this bill. Either way, I appreciate you all voicing your concerns for the future generation of scientists and all those whose lives will be affected by this bill. So let's take a, a second out about this because one I think it's tragic if anybody didn't put in their applications because of this things right. change over time graduate school takes a long time <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the light at the end of the tunnel there it might look like a very different landscape and research so please don't if it's something you have a passion for don't give it up um, but the other thing we can talk about is now these these um, bills have been modified is that correct Yes, they took out that tax tuition waiver for students. So if, uh, you know, it's hard to say, of course, what the defining factor was in removing that, but I believe that people calling really does matter. So we can, I guess at this point for this little part of the tax bill, maybe pat ourselves on the back for getting our voices heard and staying up to date with it. It's not included in the. Yeah. I don't know if it was just in my echo chamber, but boy, did I see a lot of it. Um, People complaining about 
about this all over Twitter and Facebook and um, online uh, and in the news and everywhere. I mean, it re- it really made national news talking about this and how ridiculous it was. And so, yeah, I agree with you. I, I, I'd I like to think that we made a difference. So, you know, it'll energize people to speak up in the future. I'm hoping that in a few years we'll repeal the bill because right. it's a lousy bill even without this. And we're going to yeah. change Congress in two years and this oh. is going to go. Because By the way, is the government back up and running? I saw it on is, PubMed. Yeah. Okay, because I saw on PubMed that big red. This isn't up to date because of lack of funding was gone. So yeah, it's up. Right. It's back so until uh, February eighth is their next. Yeah, uh, right. And they have Which, to by take the way, care. when the, yeah, when the government shuts down, government scientists have to stop doing their work, and that is a big problem in the progress of science. I follow NASA on Instagram, and they put up a post saying, "Sorry, we can't post until the government is back online." Isn't that sad? Just, yeah, you know, well, I know the the last time this happened, um, I think I was supposed to go for a grant review, and oh. I didn't even I didn't know if it was happening or not. And um, the person who was in charge of it wasn't allowed to email. Oh my they gosh! Just, when they shut it, you know, they they sent us an email saying if you don't hear from us, it's probably because we're not going to be able to have the review if we're shut down. But wow. yeah, so it affects review of grants. It affects distribution of funds. For researchers who have been awarded grants, however, it, it does not affect the salaries of Congress. That no, is correct. or the health insurance, right? That is correct. Which seems like the, they the should workers, change that. They should change that. I think because yeah. men, maybe there would be more of a pressure to them to get it done. Right. Yeah, but all of the other government workers get furloughed, and so they don't get paid. Mm. Yeah. So. All right. So continuing um, on a lighter note, I was thrilled to hear Cindy bring up CAR T cells during the first episode. Immunotherapy is new and exciting field and is actually what I hope to specialize in during graduate school. Oh, perfect. Yeah. The first time I heard about CAR T cells, I was blown away. So were we, which is the natural response to learning what we can, that we can engineer a T cell response. How cool is that? I hope future episodes can discuss multiple types of immunotherapy like adoptive cell transfer, co-stimulatory blockades, and cancer vaccines. I think discussing PD-1, PD-L1 would be very beneficial even for non-scientists in the audience. Just for those of you keeping track, that's one of those checkpoint inhibitors. I have been seeing more and more commercials for anti-PD-1 drugs, and I think that is important for the general public had an understanding of how these therapies work. Thank you all in advance, and I look forward to a great podcast, Matt. Well, Matt, you just heard it. We talked about some of this. Um, Thanks for the additional ideas there. Cancer vaccines, I think, are fascinating. And we could talk a lot more about um, checkpoint blockade if we got into a lot more detail, but I think we covered quite a bit of it. Um, earlier in this podcast, so right, so we're good. So this, this podcast is dedicated to you, Matt. <laughs> there you go, Steph. You take the next one. Yeah, sure. Courtney writes, greetings from Omaha, Nebraska. I don't know if y'all are doing the weather, but it's a chilly 22 degrees Fahrenheit here. I'll admit I'm a warm weather gal. Nearly 60 (laughs) in December makes me feel uneasy. I'm enjoying your latest immune episode in immune. I haven't completed it, but I do have a question. Do you think seasonality has a large impact upon lymphocyte rhythms? I did post in an article that suggests that it could impact immunity. They specifically look at C-reactive protein, um, which is a type of serum protein in the acute immune response and also soluble soluble IL-6. Cindy did note, though, that, of course, in Western countries, we spend most of our time in ambient temperature between 65 and 75, so likely we might not see these responses. But if you think about people... I mean, even in this country, there's millions of people who work outside all day long, and this they're, right. you know, I mean, depending on the weather, this could definitely, I believe, have an effect on their health and how their lymphocytes circulate throughout their body. So, yes, I do think they have an impact, but depending on where you live is how large it is. Mm-hmm. Um, I also put in there, depending on the type of mammal you're looking at, a- mammals that hibernate, that there's a paper demonstrating that you have a change in the lymphocyte circulating um, in small mammals that hibernate, and that's also driven by body temperature. And uh, she says, stay, stay excellent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next one's from Justin. Waited until episode two to say, say this, but please keep up the great podcast. If you find the time as an analytical chemist, I'd love to hear more about analytical techniques you use. Thanks. Well, sure. Uh, we could do that. What would be an analytical technique that we use? Uh, flow cytometry. Flow cytometry. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, I suppose. Um, mm, I mean, there's a. That's the big one for immunology, I guess, it's, right? It's the big one. I mean, there's a lot more things, you know, in looking mass spec. There's, you know, looking at um, sequencing, but that's kind of not specific to immunology. But we could we could talk about different. I techniques. guess ELISA's also would be immunological yeah. technique, but used for many fields, right? Yes. Right. I mean, even yeah. flow is not just for immunologists, right? So <laughs> right. really, yeah, it's not just for immunologists, and and all of those things that we've mentioned rely on antibodies and being able to use antibodies for different things. So maybe talking about how antibodies are made and what the different things we can use them for would be a useful podcast. What I think you would you should do. Uh, Cindy, is explain the Octorlone test. Oh, <laughs> that precedes my time. It does? That's so funny. It does. When I, went, was, I was in graduate school, that's what we learned in immunology. You know, I, I, and I never got it. I never understood what was going on, but it was this agar diffusion assay, which nobody yeah. uses anymore, I guess. They but. don't. But, <laughs> but the, principle, the principle of antigen and antibody concentrations cool. and precipitation is, is interesting, and we could cover that for sure. So, yeah, we have a bunch here, and uh, we'll save yeah, them for next yeah. time. But don't stop sending them in. We, we love getting your emails. So. Yeah, we love it. Immune at microbe.tv. Let's do some picks. Great. All right. Steph, what do you well, got? Yeah, I'll go first. When, you know, really getting into um, learning more about cancer immunotherapy and some of the things that are on the forefront of the field that somebody who's not really in that research myself, I was listening to a podcast called Novel Targets. It's really well done. They are funded through Genentech, which is a, a company that also produces a pr drugs, for immunotherapy drugs. But I, they say throughout the podcast, of course, that any editorial decisions are not influenced by Genentech. But it seems like a well-funded and well-done podcast that talks about what's up and coming in the drug development field. So if you want any follow-up for what we're talking about today, I would recommend that podcast. Good for them to have sponsorships. I know. I was thinking about that. And, you know, Sally Church, who's the executive producer, I've known Sally for years uh, through Should social media. Own? Sally, why don't you fund us? Yes. We're, I mean, we could. <laughs> On Twitter, I always see Sally saying, oh, I love these, these microbe TV podcasts, blah, blah, blah. And you put your money somewhere else. <laughs> How sad. That's I'll interesting. So they're supported by Genentech. Yep. And the Loncar Cancer immunotherapy index and the the there's one person it's not a panel there's one person who does interviews and it's it, i think it's his main job to run this podcast and he does a really excellent job so i recommend it yeah well we this is it's hard because this is not my main job at least now none of us but oh uh, right we do put a lot of time into it yes no ours is excellently done i think what we give is uh, you know differing opinions and a back and forth that maybe other podcasts don't do so of course you know the I'll problem is, first. I have to say, I'm hesitant to take money from pharma because then people- You're not going to hear the end of it, probably. People some. will criticize you for not being partial, right? Yep. So yep. Genentech, um, but for example, on TWIV, I can't take money from any vaccine manufacturer because we completely right. endorse vaccines and I don't want people to say that's because you're getting money from. Right. So I would, I would like to get money from other places, but- Good for you for doing that. You know, the, the thing is, someone can attack you for, for taking that money. Right. So you right. think the podcast is well done, Steph, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think our, <laughs> I was going to say, I think ours is better. No, I'm just kidding. But of course, <laughs> because of the of course, two ours of you. Is, <laughs> ours is the best. But then if you're going to listen to another one, if you have time, listen to all of them on microbe.tv and then go to Novel Targets. All right. I'll check it out on your recommendation. <laughs> Cindy, what do you have? So when I was um, reading all of this literature and things about these CAR T cells, and I started reading these names of all of these immunotherapies, my head almost exploded. And I said, I don't understand what Chichenzheng you sell something like Lala was. And so I, my pick of the week is um, something on immunotherapy nomenclature. And this is from the Cancer Research Institute website. And they explain all these crazy names of the the various different immunotherapies and break down um, what what actually is is each name is made up of individual components that if you know um, and can decode the nomenclature, you can figure out 
what it was. And so an easy one, for example, is any of the um, immunotherapies that end in MAB, like rituximab, that just means it's a monoclonal antibody. And so um, the two is for targeting a tumor. So rituximab, so it's targeting a tumor and the, the XI in rituximab actually means a chimeric monoclonal antibody. And so if you have these um, individual fragments, you can understand when you see the commercial for, for your voy and it's ipilimumab, you can figure out what that actually means. Um, and so you can, you may not know what it targets, but you might know, oh, that's an, a monoclonal antibody or this, um, all of the ones that are cell based therapies end in lucell or leculucell. And so you can figure out what the therapy actually is and what it's targeting from the name. So all these crazy names, with all the X's and the Y's and, and um, crazy little fragments. It actually makes sense when you have this cheat sheet to understand what the nomenclature is and decode it. So I highly recommend if you want to try and figure out what all of these crazy immunotherapies are and what these crazy words mean, check out this website because I think you'll be surprised at how much you can actually understand what those name, those crazy names are. It's really good. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it really breaks them down too. I think it's very cool. All right, my pick is uh, a little fun video, which I discovered on TWIM, um, which is dropping this week. Uh, we did a paper on, this is really amazing story of, in, in Antarctica, there are there are parts of Antarctica which uh, is actual soil. It's not all ice. Um, and many people go down there and, and study these soils. In this one paper, they show that there are bacteria, there's a microbiome in this soil, and it lives off of trace gases in the atmosphere because there's nothing else for it to grow on. Wow. <laughs> Seriously, wow. <laughs> anyway, crazy. I wanted to see the area where they were working on, so I was looking for photos and videos, and I came across this video on Facebook. It has nothing to do with the original paper, but it's a, it's a bunch of other Australian researchers, and it's just cool. This penguin yeah. just jumps out oh, of the water saw it. <laughs> onto the boat. It's so cute. He's so cute. <laughs> he kind of slips around, and he's looking for food probably. And then he yeah. gets scared and he jumps back in. <laughs> but it's so cool. I mean, just yeah. jumps right out of the water oh, and he jumps back. Yeah, that's fun. Anyway, so that's cute. It's the Australian. Yeah, give a little midday break. That's a good video. Australian Antarctic Division. Penguins are just awesome. I think they are so pretty cool. cool animals. Although I hear they smell. <laughs> I th yeah. Probably. I heard they if you, like if you, most wild animals. If you go where they're living and there are lots of them, it smells really bad, but they don't really care about what we think. They right, like, I like guess. Fish and poop and fish and poop. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, listeners, if you have pics, you can send them in, immune at microbe.tv. We'd love to have some. We have lots on all our other shows. So get with it. Get with the program. You can find us at microbe.tv slash immune. You can find us on any podcatcher app. Just, slash, just search for immune and you'll find it. And please subscribe so you get every episode. It's just one a month. So it's not so bad to do that and you get them automatically. That helps us to know how many people are out there. Uh, and consider supporting us. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. And, uh, you know, there are many ways you can help us out financially, and they're all listed there. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University and on Twitter, Cindy Leifer, all one word. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. That was really good. I really appreciate that. That was fun. Steph Langle is at Ohio State University. She's on Twitter, Stephanie Langle, all one word. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, thank you. This was great. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'm P-R-O-F-V-R-R -R on Twitter. The music on Immune is by Steve Neal. You can find his work at stevenealpercussion.com. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month. 